Hi, I'm Adam Isaacson. I work at the Washington Office on Latin America, which is a research organization that does a lot of work from a human rights perspective here in Washington, focused obviously on Latin America. I work on security there, and in particular for about the last 13 years now, I've worked a lot at and on the U.S.-Mexico border and on the issue of migration. And I'm talking to you right now in March of 2024. This is a time of year where we do get asked to do a lot of sort of basic lectures or explanations of what is happening at the border, the origins of what we're seeing, this rather historic moment of migration, all the way, not just at the U.S.-Mexico border, but all through Latin America and all the way along the migrant trail. And so because, you know, I do have now a rather up-to-date <laughs> set of slides and images and graphics to describe what's going on, I thought I might just do a public version and put this up. And this will have a few ums and uhs and filler words and and just like I'm doing right now but let's get going basically you know right now if you read the papers at all you know the Biden administration is sort of the, you know the press always puts it they're on the defensive because of a large number of migrants at the US Mexico border but this is actually not something dramatically new asylum seekers are maybe the what is new the profile of migrant has changed a lot especially starting in the last 10 years at the US Mexico border the until about 2009 2010 90 percent of all migrants at the US Mexico border were people from Mexico and those people from Mexico were overwhelmingly adults so the profile of a migrant coming as recently as 13, 14 years ago was somebody who was probably coming for economic reasons, looking for work, maybe not even intending to stay in the United States, earn some money, go home, or start in, in some cases start a new life here. But as you can see from this chart, that blue is migrants who Border Patrol apprehended at the U.S.-Mexico border who were citizens of Mexico. Brown is everywhere else. And something happens in the sort of the end of the Obama administration, middle of not that Obama had anything to do with it, but the, the middle of the 2010s, you started seeing people from more other countries starting to come, particularly from Central America. And at the same time, you saw more people coming who were children or families, uh, children coming on their own without parents or uh, entire families, parents with children showing up at the U.S.-Mexico border. Most of those families were, in fact, from Central America. We'll talk about that in a little, in a little while. But what this chart shows brown is unaccompanied children, green is family unit members, you see this first rise or increase in the spring of 2014, ten, 10 years ago exactly as I'm giving this, this discussion. That looks small now, but that increase in this new profile of migrant who was seeking protection and asking to turn themselves into Border Patrol, that took the Obama administration completely by surprise. They were not, the whole U.S. border apparatus was not prepared for this, especially kids and families. All of a sudden, it's not single Mexican, mostly men. It is people who need humanitarian assistance. And this is what Border Patrol's sort of jail-like stations that had been built over the years to accommodate single male migrants were suddenly filled with kids and families and who, who needed to be processed and who in fact were not trying to run away from Border Patrol. And this was the scene, uh, and it has been continually seen off and on for the last 10 years as this new profile of migrants started showing up. And again, they're turning themselves into U.S. agents, Border Patrol or CBP, with the, the uh, intent to apply for asylum. Like most of the developed world, the United States has in its laws the right to seek asylum. If you are physically on U.S. soil, you have the right to say, I fear going back to my country for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political belief, or membership in a specific social group. I, th I believe that if I am returned, I will be killed, imprisoned, tortured. And if you say that and you're on your soil, you have the legal right to have a hearing with due process to determine the severity of your threat and whether it meets the standard of asylum. So that is what people are doing, which is their, their full legal right according to the Refugee Convention and according to the Refugee Act of 1980. If a child arrives without parents, a 2008 law also says if they are not from Mexico or Canada, they are automatically 
put into sort of asylum proceedings. They don't have to actually ask for protection. There's enough of a, a danger that they may in fact be trafficked or something like that. So unaccompanied children uh, as quickly as possible are handed off to the Office of Refugee Resettlement within the U.S. government, which then keeps them in shelters until it can place them either with relatives or other sponsors inside the United States. Now, let's talk for a while about why people are fleeing and why this number suddenly started going up so much. The, the, the reasons are mixed. Often you will talk to the same person, like I've done this, you talk to somebody like at the border in a shelter and you know, you say, why did you flee, I don't know, Honduras? And the, the person will say, quite often, this is happening more than once, they'll say, you know, the, the economy is really bad, you just can't make enough money to eat, there's no, there's no employment. And then you talk for a little longer and maybe five minutes or ten minutes into the conversation they'll say oh they killed my brother they killed my cousin usually they being the gangs or organized crime because he didn't pay extortion or the gangs were trying to recruit my daughter something like that but they don't often lead with that story but what you find is there's often a mixture of economic reasons and fear or as you can see from this poll data which the UN High Commission for Refugees with during that first wave of Central American kids they took this poll of a few hundred of them to find out why they were leaving and the reasons overlapped so much that they ended up drawing this very confusing looking Venn diagram showing that yeah some people were fleeing violence either specific or non-specific threats some people were being you know some kids were being abused at home some kids were just hungry some kids wanted to get reunited with their family in the United States and often the same kid or the same person will leave for many reasons that's why we talk a lot about mixed flows but some of the key reasons that people are fleeing in several countries right left and center government repression I'm sorry to say is worsening despite the best efforts of groups like WOLA the democratic sort of openings of, of Latin America of the 1980s and 1990s are reversing and in several countries it is much more likely than it was in the past to end up being a political prisoner to end up being rounded up in jail because you look like a gang member or or, or you know the, this or in some cases, you may be threatened by an organized crime group or a gang, and the government is either unable or unwilling or completely completely co-opted by the organized crime uh, uh, structure so that you are completely unprotected. Um, now, the gangs, organized crime, that runs the gamut from you know the huge, powerful, wealthy Mexican cartels to the small, yet very powerful in their neighborhoods, uh, networks of gangs that operate in Central America. But on the ground, the impact can be quite the same. Um, where you live is unlivable. You are displaced. You may be unsafe anywhere in your country. Um, you have been extorted out of business, so you can't make a living. Um, but whatever it is, this is a huge reason why people decide to uproot and leave their countries. Another one is just generalized insecurity. Latin America is a region with almost no real wars or armed conflicts. There's a few, but they don't impact that much of the region. But it's a region that has 8% of the world's population. This is the pink on the on the left side of this box from the world from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. 8% of the world's population and about 33 to 35% of the world's homicides. And, you know, extrapolate that for other forms of violent crime also. Not a region necessarily at war, but one of the hardest places to live in terms of violence. And if you are male, if you are in a, you know, especially a younger age group, uh, the, the, the likelihood of facing homicide or other harm is even greater. You know this. You know you compare this chart from. You know the, there's an organization, great organization called Insight Crime, that keeps track of homicide rates throughout the Americas. You compare entire countries to some U.S. cities with some of the highest homicide rates, and the countries are comparable to the cities. Imagine that extrapolated throughout the entire length and breadth of a, of a country, rural or urban, uh, and that gives you a sense of why people might be fleeing violence. Related, but also a key part of this is, is hunger or poverty. I mean, poverty, particularly extreme poverty, or for many migrants who may be you know, middle class or lower middle class, the very real danger of economic conditions forcing them to fall back into poverty, the pain of either subsisting on one or two meals a day or putting your own children to bed hungry uh, is something that a lot of people feel, especially in, in Central America, Haiti, but also pockets of some of the wealthier countries, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, where there's been a lot of economic mismanagement. Hunger is real, and people generally don't tend to stay put where they live uh, when they are extremely hungry. 
Um, this is exacerbated by climate conditions. Uh, Latin America is very susceptible uh, to climate change. You have an area through the middle of Central America called the Dry Corridor where droughts have been more and more and more severe and growing seasons are shorter. You have a lot of superstorms that are happening as, as ocean temperatures heat up. You have areas like the Andes where people are very dependent on snow melt and, and glacier melt for fresh water and even for hydroelectric generation and that is starting to fade also. This is going obviously as in all of the world to get worse in coming years. Those are some of the main reasons but I mean that's there's many other reasons that we hear a lot domestic violence or other gender-based violence forces a lot of women to flee particularly communities with high numbers of, ho uh, of femicides discrimination against you know black or indigenous BTQ migrants is is a key reason why a lot of asylum seekers say that they left I mentioned family reunification which is less of a you know something pushing people and more pulling people but if you do have relatives including parents who are here in the United States ultimately the desire for family reunification is, is, is enormous. And this last one I put, loss of hope, I think is a big motivator that's sort of in code or, or ineffable, hard to describe, but I was having a conversation with a Honduran journalist in Honduras last year, and he made this point, like, you know, we, we work, I was working in a newspaper, you know, we all made middle-class incomes, and one of the reporters who was in charge of reporting on sports, on, on, on soccer, he just decided to leave the country. And I said, are you threatened? What's going on? And he said, no, I'm doing okay. That's the thing. I have a future, he said. I don't think this country has a future. Uh, and I have a feeling that, that that's sort of a feeling that a lot of people that you see on the migrant trail have. They're not like the poorest of the poor who are all, you know, desperate and on the fringe of poverty. A lot of those people can't get the resources to together even to make the trip. It's a lot of people who have ambitions but feel that their own country is holding those ambitions and, and their pursuit of happiness to call it that holding that back and that's a key thing but okay so i mentioned that you know asylum seeking is a much larger reason why people are now arriving at the u.s mexico border that the population is much more children and families than before this year right now it's about half unaccompanied children or family unit members and it's also much more international I mentioned that you know Mexico is about 90% of the migrant population going into the 2010s. That's the blue in this chart. But you'll see the blue just keeps shrinking in terms of its share of the total migrant population. And it gets taken up for a while. You can see there in the 2010s, really up until the pandemic, by the green, brown, and yellow. That is what used to be what is pejoratively called the Northern Triangle, uh, El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala, which, you know, by 2019 or so, about 95, I don't have it in front of me, about 95% of the migrant population was either Mexican or from those three countries, Mexican, Honduran, Guatemalan, or Salvadoran. And something happened with the pandemic, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but starting around 2021, it got way more international. The rest of Latin America, South America, places very far away, started showing up at the border in much larger numbers to the point where that blue, green, brown, and yellow are now just half of the total and every place else is the other half. And in that gray, that other countries there that is getting bigger and bigger, a lot of those other countries which see Customs and Border Protection, CBP, the, the U.S. agency that is in charge of this, doesn't report in a really useful way. The other countries are often not in the Americas, they're not in the Western Hemisphere. We'll look at some of those other countries soon, but it's mostly Asia and Africa, with a smattering of Europe put in there. Here, and I mentioned, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but you'll see at the beginning of this, and also at the end, I'll also sh share the address that you can type in to download a copy of this whole presentation as a PDF because you're not going to have enough time to really read this very busy looking slide. But this shows the top, I believe it's 17 uh, countries uh, where migrants came from at the U.S.-Mexico border in 2021 through 2023. And you can see this enormous diversity to the point where, you know, countries that are really far away, like, like Venezuela and Colombia, are now in the top five countries that people uh, of, of, of origin or of nationality of people showing up at the U.S.-Mexico border. This diversity is unprecedented. It's, it's really a, a new reality at the border. So it's not just that it's not just a single adults, it's a much broader variety of nations. Let's look at some of these countries and, and just what the patterns are. I mean, Mexico has been, as I said, really the number one 
obviously it's the closest country to the United States along the migrant trail. And it's been the number one nationality at the US-Mexico border. A lot of people in Mexico have always fled for economic reasons. Uh, increasingly though, uh, Mexico's organized crime problem continues to be way out of hand. It is aided and abetted by official corruption in many parts of the country. We are seeing a lot of internal displacement in Mexico, a lot of forced disappearance and other human rights crimes in Mexico. And some of those people who are internally displacing are coming to the US-Mexico border. A lot of the, there's been a big jump in families from Mexico since 2023, really since the Title 42 policy ended. And the families very frequently are fleeing sort of uh, Pacific Coast states like Michoacan, Guerrero, Jalisco, places where um, there's a lot of competition between cartels, particularly the upstart um, Jalisco New, New Generation Cartel and, and, the, and the Sinaloa Cartel and all of its factions. But all, there are many other regions in Mexico that people are fleeing. And we're starting to see that represented more than just regular single adult Mexican migrants. Who, you know, So Mexicans are now coming and turning themselves into Border Patrol in a way that they really weren't even before the pandemic. Venezuela is quite a case. I mean, since t about 2015, one quarter of Venezuela's population, nearly 8 million people, have left the country. The vast majority, the vast majority of that 8 million people are elsewhere in the Americas. About one out of every four people today in Colombia uh, was born in Venezuela and left within the last eight or nine years. But that population, because of, largely because of the Dadian Gap opening up, and I'll talk about that soon, that population is now starting to come to the US-Mexico border as well. There's probably about a million Venezuelan born people now in the United States up from maybe just a little more than 100,000 when the century began. And so that's still a tiny fraction, or just a small fraction, an eighth or so of all Venezuelans who've left. But the United States became accessible first because at some point, I don't know why exactly, in 2021, it became evident that Mexico had, that this would, had already been the case for a while, that Mexico was not requiring visas of people flying in from many countries in South America. And, you know, Venezuela was one of them. So you can see this rise in 2021 of Venezuelans arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border, which had never, there'd never been a significant flow of Venezuelans to the U.S.-Mexico border before. But they come in 2021, they are flying. Almost everybody in that blue rise there is is arriving at Mexican airports, getting on a bus or, or some other vehicle and going to the U.S.-Mexico border and turning themselves into border patrol. That stops, as you can see, very abruptly in February of 2022 because under strong U.S. suggestion, the Mexican government started requiring visas of Venezuelans arriving at its airports. And so a lot of Venezuelans could no longer make that journey. But then the number starts going up again in by the second half of 2022. That's because Venezuelans start taking the Dadian Gap, this this treacherous route along that, that str straddles Colombia and, and Panama. And I'll talk about that further down some more. But these are almost everybody from 2022 on on this graph arrived on foot. They were obviously by land. They did not fly anywhere. And they many of them, or most of them, uh, came through the Dadian Gap. And you can see the numbers go down again in the end of 2022 into early 2023. At the time, the Biden administration was implementing the Trump era Title 42 policy, which denied the right to ask asylum to people citing the pandemic. And basically, if you if you were caught by Border Patrol and they could expel you back into Mexico or back to your home country, they would do so. Venezuelans were hard to expel until in October of 2022, the Biden administration convinced Mexico to start taking Venezuelans expelled across the border into Mexico as well, uh, which Mexico did. But even that only had a short term effect and then title 42 ended in in may of 2023 and we've seen uh, even more people coming from venezuela with m making up the majority of people coming through the daddy and gap that's a it's quite a case people and i should also before i go on add that people coming from venezuela this unlike a lot of other countries this is where you are seeing often the especially the current waves coming it's the it is the poorest of the poor it is people who lived in the slums don't have money don't can't can't pull together thousands of dollars to pay a smuggler they get stranded many times along the way between uh, Venezuela Colombia uh, going across Mexico because they run out of money and they have to work or beg or do something until they can like, buy a bus ticket or pay whatever bribe they have to pay and keep going and a lot of them get to the United States and because this is a pretty new flow of people, there weren't a lot of Venezuelans, uh, particularly poor Venezuelans, in the United States before, they end up 
uh, not having a lot of contacts. Uh, they don't have a couch they can crash on somewhere. They don't have a cousin somewhere who's going to give them a job. They don't even have a particular city of destination in mind many, many times. And that is not that is new. I mean, uh, most uh, nationalities patterns, have, there's always been some sort of some sort of support network inside the United States. But so Venezuelans who have come without any, you know, without anything ready for them or any place to stay, uh, they do make up a large percentage of the population that is sort of staying in shelters or depending on social services in some of the cities where they've arrived, like New York, because they lack that. Obviously, as there are more Venezuelans here, hopefully there will be more support networks and, and, and other things. But of course, there also needs to be more resources for the cities that are receiving these asylum seekers. That was a lot, a lot about Venezuela, but it is probably the most dynamic of all the countries we're talking about. Guatemala has been less dynamic, but Guatemala is the number one source or the number one nationality of unaccompanied children, kids who arrive without their parents. It has been the number two or number three country most years until it was overtaken by Venezuela recently. But yeah, Guatemala, its citizens were subject to Title 42 expulsion into Mexico, and so you didn't see a lot of growth during the pandemic. Some bounce back, a lot of families coming, um, but it is not actually increasing. Neither is Honduras. Guatemala and Honduras often follow similar uh, migration trends. Um, also, its citizens could be expelled into Mexico under Title 42. And there's been some recovery, but it's, it's uh, since Title 42 ended, but still not a lot. This is also a population that is very heavily children and families. Colombia, Colombia's citizens, Colombia really did not have, like Venezuela, didn't have a history of people coming to the U.S.-Mexico border until really the, during the pandemic. And Colombians can, could and can still fly to Mexico without arranging for a visa beforehand, although Mexico has done what it can to crack down on their, the arrivals of people who seem like they're really trying to get to the U.S.-Mexico border. Mexico and Colombia are members of something called the Pacific Alliance, which also includes Chile and Peru. Those four countries don't require visas of each other. They have sort of a, what they call a Schengen arrangement, so that people from Colombia can still fly to Mexico, and many are still coming to the airports and then making their way to the U.S.-Mexico border and turning themselves in and asking for asylum. That's not to say that all of their cases are, are not real asylum cases or frivolous or anything like that, because Colombia does continue to have huge problems of organized crime, tied corruption, armed conflict, and government officials who carry out repression on their own with impunity. I the people, many people from Colombia can still have that story, and I often find myself, as somebody who worked on Colombia a lot in the past, still serving as an expert witness in some very compelling asylum cases in the U.S. immigration court system. Cuba, people from Cuba have obviously been coming for a very long time. They started taking land routes in the years after Cuba, I think it was in 2014, when Cuba lifted exit visas that its own citizens would have needed to leave the country. A lot of those routes went through Guyana and South America by air and then, and, and then, and then up through land to the Mexico border. More recently, starting in the end of 2021, Nicaragua decided to waive or do away with visa requirements for visitors from Cuba. And as a result, many plane loads of, of people from Cuba have left the island going to Nicaragua and have used that as their jumping off point for their, their, their travel to the United States. In January of 2023, you can see the numbers just drop off the edge there. That's when the Biden administration convinced Mexico to take Title 42 expulsions into its territory of citizens of Cuba. Um, the numbers have since recovered, but as you can see, the blue turned to green. What does that mean? I keep showing this and I haven't explained it yet. Um, green means that the migrants came to a port of entry. They were actually able to approach a U.S. official at an official border crossing and ask for asylum. Um, I'll talk about this in a little while. That can be hard to do, but Cubans have been doing that rather than in blue showing up, you know, by going through the desert or, or climbing over the wall or finding a gap in the wall or going through the Rio Grande and turning themselves into border patrol. That is technically illegal in the United States, although the law also says that you can apply for asylum without regard to how you came to the United States. So people still turn themselves into border patrol and ask for asylum and often are not prosecuted for that because there'd never be enough jail space. But the Cuban population has increasingly not gone uh, the blue way <laughs> by crossing to, into Border Patrol's custody because because it's illegal, the United States has, the Biden administration has continued to convince Mexico to take some of their citizens of Cuba 
Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Haiti back under a post-Title 42 asylum ban. So Mexico takes its own citizens and a few, at least, of those other countries' citizens back. So Cubans aren't risking going between the ports of entry. If you cross at a port of, at a port of entry, the Biden administration is not applying that rule to you. Ecuador, sort of similar to Venezuela, its citizens did have the ability to fly visa-free to Mexico under U.S. pressure. Mexico did away with that and near the end of 2021. The numbers declined, and everything you've seen since 2021 are Ecuadorians making their way through the Darien Gap over land to the United States. Ecuador is the number two nationality of migrants coming through the Darien Gap these days. And, you know, with It's the only country I can think of that has had a six-fold increase, six times in its homicide rate in just three years, from 2020 to 2023. The organized crime problem there has gotten out of hand in a hurry. Something really snapped in the drug trade involving probably Mexican and Colombian groups on both ends that has made many parts of Ecuador, particularly Pacific coastal areas, very difficult places to live. So a lot of people are fleeing violence, but also the economic ruin that goes along with that. Nicaragua, dictatorship that especially especially after a crackdown in 2018, has just hemorrhaged people. A lot of Nicaraguans have fled to Costa Rica and sought asylum there, but an increasing number have migrated uh, to the United States as well. In January, Nicaragua is one of the four countries, January of 2023, Nicaragua is one of the four countries that uh, the Biden administration convinced Mexico to take their citizens back across the border as expelled people. And now under a new post Title 42 uh, asylum rule, those who cross between ports of entry can still be sent back. The population of Nicaraguans really never recovered at the border, really never recovered from that crackdown, the expulsions into Mexico in January 2023. You can see their numbers got very high, though, just before that. Haiti, people have, people have fled Haiti for a long time, of course, but it got, there was a big wave of people that left after the 2010 earthquake. Many of them went to South America, where Brazil and later Chile were offering them work permits because they had a lot of labor needs. Haitian labor played a huge role in building Brazil's World Cup and Olympic stadiums in the 2010s. After the pandemic hit and the economies declined and more right-wing governments came, both countries became pretty unhospitable to Haitians. They started leaving South America, going the whole, the entire just hemisphere, traveling on land, going through the Darien Gap. And that's that big spike you see in 2021. Those are Haitians who actually went through the Darien Gap. Really, the first significant large-scale migration through what had been an impenetrable migration route. Of course, they've opened it now for uh, many other nationalities, but that was 2021. That big spike in September 2021, what you probably recall if you were around then, the, the videos and images of Border Patrol agents on horseback like charging at Haitian migrants who were just massively camped out on the U.S. side of the Rio Grande in Del Rio, Texas. That was that episode when many of them came at once. And then it took a dive after that because after that, that, that incident or the, that several days when, when Haitians arrived massively, the Biden administration using Title 42 just massively, massively deported Haitians, more than 20,000 of them, back to the island over the next several months. Um, the island that, of course, is in a state of semi-anarchy with gang violence and extreme poverty and everything else. Um, so Haitians really stopped coming between the ports of entry uh, after that um, and, and started coming to the ports of entry because they did not want to get flown back to, to Port-au-Prince against their will. And so most of the Haitian flow now are people who make appointments to report at an official border crossing with a process that I'll talk about later. Peru, like Colombia, is a member of the Pacific Alliance, so its, its citizens can still fly visa-free to Mexico. So most of the Peruvian citizens you're seeing here arrived to Mexico by air and then reported to the U.S. border to turn themselves in. A lot of them come to Yuma, or at least until recently, it came to Yuma, Arizona, which is an interesting, a lot of Colombians too, which seems to point to the smuggling route, just preferring to bring people that way for reasons that I actually can't explain. But conditions Peru in Peru have gotten graver as well. The economy really has not climbed out of the crater that it was dug into it by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a lot of measures, the per capita death rate from COVID-19 was higher in Peru than anywhere else in the world. And then it's been followed by a lot of political instability and government repression. I'm speaking to you in March 2024. Freedom House, an NGO that tracks democracy around the world, just came out with its annual rankings of the quality of democracy and found that Peru Peru's democracy declined more than any other country in Latin America in 2023. 
So it is a place where people are fleeing for mixed flows as well, not just because it's easy to fly to Mexico. El Salvador has not seen growth in the number of people leaving lately, but they, you know, they are when since going back to that first wave of child and family migration, El Salvador has always been a, a large source of, of, of unaccompanied children and, and families coming to the U.S. border um, over the last 10 years in particular. A lot of Salvadorans fled also in the 1980s. I'll talk about that in a bit when civil wars were a civil war was raging in the country. The country, of course, has a popular but authoritarian trending president, Nayib Bukele, who has by jailing 1.7 percent of the population managed to keep homicide rates down to historically low levels, but you're sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop as, as checks and balances and other indicators of democracy decline in El Salvador. What's going to happen to living conditions and the migrant flow in you know, three, four, five years from now? That, I would say that per, the, the, the diagnosis is grim. Russia, you saw a lot of Russians coming, usually flying to Mexico, and then and then making their way to the US border, usually preferring to turn themselves in at ports of entry. And you know, you see a big spike in late 2022, a bit after uh, Putin really intensified the military draft to go get people to fight the, the Ukraine war. A lot of people objected to being forced to fight the Ukraine war and have left. And that continues to be a pretty significant flow of people with pretty strong asylum cases, who of course, the United States isn't about to deport to Moscow. India has also seen a lot of growth in people coming, many of them crossing through the Dadian Gap, in fact. And, you know, that's a combination of, of people who are lower caste or people from Muslim parts of the country or people otherwise feeling persecuted by the Modi government, and usually people who are middle class enough to be able to afford just the enormous smuggling fees, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars to make it, usually starting in Ecuador and then all the way up to the U.S. Mexico border. Brazil, similar to in some way to, to Venezuela and and Ecuador had you know the, the route where Brazilians could fly to Mexico visa free was shut down in early 2022 and since then there's been a moderate but but not growing flow of Brazilians often using the Darien Gap but not always to come to the United States. China has been in more recently a, a sharp increase in, in, in flow. There's a, a lot of people are fleeing, obviously, repressive, repressive government in China, but also there's some, some folks are, are claiming religious persecution, and others are just being affected already by what appears to be a massive economic downturn in China. But you're seeing a lot of Chinese who often fly to Ecuador, often go through the Darien Gap, usually, but not always, but usually they're middle class people who've managed to scrape together enough money so that their journey is not as arduous as, say, a Venezuelan's journey. A lot of, say, boat travel that, that, that cuts down on the length of the walk through the Darien Gap and things like that. But I think we will continue to see a lot of growth in, in arrivals of citizens of China. And the Chinese government does not take deportation flights, even as expensive as those would be anyway. So, you know, whether the asylum case is taken or not, it's not like the United States has any place to send Chinese citizens back. So that route is probably likely to continue to expand. Um, Turkey, I think, um, not as up on what's happening in Turkey, but I know the Erdogan government is far from from democratic, so we'll probably see more people coming there. Romania is worthy of note, even though the numbers are just a few hundred a month. People who are members of the Roma ethnic group, what used to be pejoratively called gypsies, are a large amount of the Romanians who we do see at the U.S.-Mexico border at times. And then there's this whole other category that I mentioned where CBP doesn't really break it down. That has also grown enormously, that other. And a lot of that is citizens of countries in Africa, maybe uh, elsewhere in South Asia as well. Afghanistan's in there, Bangladesh is in there, Mauritania, and some of the other West African, West African, Sub-Saharan African countries have, have registered pretty high in this. And these are a lot of these, Cameroon, these are countries with uh, a lot of government repression and people who just have to get out. A lot of them are finding their way to the airport in Managua, Nicaragua, again, with that visa-free travel and, and then making their way up across Mexico with smugglers. So, you know, what are some of the origins of, of why, particularly Latin America, let's start with Latin America as a place people want uh, to flee. This is a region where, you know, a lot of the countries are middle income, but the income distribution is really bad. You know, we talk a lot about the 1% and, and income and wealth inequality in the United States, but most of Latin America, as you can see here, has higher measures of inequality than the United States or even the, the world average. And that, when you look at what that means on the ground, it means you do have a, a, a tiny 
percentage of the population, a real class division, people who, a small number of people who have much of the wealth don't really want to pay taxes. The, the dark sort of, this is a OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development uh, chart, the way they drew it, that, that bold line going across is the percentage of the economy that Latin American governments collect as taxes, the amount of taxes that the wealthiest in particular are willing to pay, although a lot of these taxes are regressive also. The lighter line way up above is the percentage of economies that are captured as taxes in the developed world. Latin Americas, that those small elites don't like to pay their taxes. They will, you know, re resist that. And even what does get paid too often gets lost to corruption uh, because of high impunity. So what I'm saying here is, yeah, there's not that social contract. It's very weak, and you do have this small elite that sadly has often benefited from historically very high, very solid, very strong, unquestioning U.S. support. Those elites promised the United States stability. They promised the United States over the years help in confronting whatever was the threat that was most on the minds of U.S. security or economic planners in the country. You can go back to, you know, the, the banana republics and and, and support for, for U.S. Uh, companies back, you know, in the pre-World War two era, but certainly the Cold War, we backed some real monsters. There's Gusto Pinochet, one example, and, and because they were anti-communist during the Cold War, during the war on drugs, again, a military approach to the region, viewing it as a region of threats, elites promising to, to be our allies in the war on drugs, even as many of them, like Juan Orlando Hernandez there at the bottom, was, was up to his eyeballs in, in cocaine trafficking. Elites promised to be our partners in the war on terror and the fight against organized crime. And now that the United States is more and more concerned about competition for influence with Russia and China, that is another way that this 1% in the region can avoid accountable governance that would actually allow reforms to happen, that would make these countries less places people would want to flee. And still, you know, the United States, I think, is, in its policy has gotten somewhat better in recent years, but still views it still is willing to tolerate a lot of bad behavior from elites, even if it causes more migration to happen. And a key tool of that, something that I've tracked heavily over the course of my career, is U.S. police, military and police assistance, which, you know, during the Bush administration totaled about you know, well over $2 million a day for a while. It is less now. And we'll see what happens as, you know, if more, you know, sort of conservative pro-U.S. governments get elected, whether they, if they start asking for more equipment and, and training, whether that will happen. But military aid... Uh, especially during anti-democratic periods, has been a key way uh, to show support for elites who then use that aid or just simply use their security forces to silence dissent. Uh, really during the 1980s, 70s and 80s, I should say, at a time of dictatorships, many of them pro-U.S. dictatorships, Latin America lost an entire generation of independent voices, people who could have been, you know, reformers, people who could have done something about that, that 1% the lack of interest in good governance, but they were either exiled or killed or, you know, now they're you know, dispersed. And you lost a generation of good minds. And so we're still sort of seeing that impact, I think, now in the amount of people who migrate. Another, you know, indirect but important cause uh, or link between U.S. policy and migration is the gang problem, in, particularly in, in Central America. Um, El Salvador had a vicious civil war in the 1980s where the Reagan administration generously, a million dollars a day at, point at times, gave aid to the Salvadoran military to fight that war. It was so brutal that El Salvador had about five million people, about a million of them left the country in the 1980s, came to the United States. Most of them came to the United States. In some neighborhoods, particularly where a lot of them settled in Los Angeles, in some neighborhoods, the kids of those people who fled they formed gangs, in part to protect themselves against, say, Mexican gangs in East L.A. and things like that. And those gangs got more cohesive. Two of the, the gangs that were founded in Los Angeles are the Mara Salvatrucha, MS-13, and Barrio 18, Barrio 18. They started in the United States. But what happened? You know, a lot of these people got involved in illegality, criminality, and the United States would, U.S. authorities would arrest them and imprison them. After they were imprisoned, they weren't released into the United States. Of course, they would be sent back to their countries of citizenship. And you started seeing this in a big way, really, that, you know, you see a lot of growth on this chart of, of deportations of criminal aliens uh, in the 2010s. But I think your key, your key years here are the 1990s and the early 2000s, when a lot of gang members um, are sent back to uh, El Salvador in particular, but all of the countries. And 
the United States does not do a really good job of either letting those gov governments know that the people on this deportation plane are, you know, are, are, are deep into gang activity. And even if they did let them know, they didn't give them a lot of assistance or other help just trying to integrate them uh, more properly into communities. So we just, we just kind of dumped gang members into these countries, countries with very weak governance because of that elite non-interest in governing, uh, high levels of corruption, and the gangs just metastasize in the cities of, of El Salvador, but to some extent Honduras and Guatemala also, taking over the poorer neighborhoods and becoming just a, a monstrously bigger than their U.S. counterparts, and generating conditions of insecurity and horror and day-to-day -day misery that have forced just actually literally millions of people to leave uh, the gang-infested parts of Central America. So it's just been an enormous boomerang effect of U.S. policy. All right, so let's talk a bit about routes, how people are, are, are leaving. I mean, you see the, the on the left is sort of the map of, I'd mentioned Haitians going to Brazil and to Chile for work and then giving up, you know, during the pandemic, making their way across South America through the Darien and up through Mexico. That was a pretty common route. A lot of people from Cuba took a similar route. You can see the blue arrow in the right going to Guyana and then out out up the, the, the isthmus. The orange arrow going into Ecuador is very important too. Ecuador's 2008 constitution really declares a right of human mobility and therefore does not require visas of a lot of nationalities who around the world. So that's a place that, that you know you can arrive on a plane and then hook up with a smuggler and then make that long journey if you are extra continental. But those are what some of the routes have tended to look like. But, you know, if you're coming from South America, at some point you're hitting the Darien Gap. And, you know, in the 20th century, there was just an engineering marvel. We have a highway that goes from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego at the bottom of Chile called the Pan American Highway. But it does have a gap. It stops in this area between Colombia and Panama where the jungle is incredibly dense. The topography is really difficult. It's very hard to maintain even a, a decent government presence in this area. It's sort of like a, a little spot of the deepest Amazon, like right there east of the Panama Canal and, and as you hit Colombia. And in, in Spanish, it's called the Tapón del Darien, the Darien stopper or plug, but it is no longer a plug. Um, uh, again, as I said, you can see that chart in the lower left showing all of a sudden the numbers of people going through the Darien Gap going up. And it's green for Haiti there, but it soon becomes blue for Venezuela in subsequent years. And very quickly, all of a sudden, 520,000 people went through the Darien Gap in 2023. It's just a stunning change. People come up to that town Necocli in the upper right. You can see a town called Necocli on the Gulf of Uraba. They take these boats. I took a picture of those boats in, in October of last year that go across to the other side and then into Panama on a 60 mile, just incredibly treacherous, exhausting walk. But you see entire families, one fifth of people going through this gap, the Darien Gap right now are children. And of those, of those one-fifth, half of them are children under the age of six. It's just stunning who is actually, and that's a lot of Venezuelans who have no other choice, people who are making this incredibly difficult journey. It's not just difficult because of jungle conditions and drownings and these fast rivers and animal bites and things like that. It's dangerous because it's ungoverned and organized crime just has free reign over how it can treat people, how it can extort people, but also how it can attack, kill, and, and rape people. Everybody, well, not everybody, but literally, or not literally, practically everybody who's gone through the Darien Gap can tell you that they've seen dead bodies along the trail or parts of dead bodies along the trail. And an enormous number of mostly women, but an enormous number of people have suffered sexual violence at the, at the hands of gangs and bandits and other people who are just roaming the jungle. Doctors Without Borders, you can see that, that little inset in the left said that in 2023, Doctors Without Borders maintains these humanitarian posts at the end of the Darien Gap Trail. They say that they, they treated 676 uh, people who were sexually assaulted, and that's who talked to them about it. The number could, in fact, be even higher. It's a harrowing, harrowing trip, but it's not the end of the harrowing part of the trip. It, it remains miserable the whole way. Another a way to avoid the Darien Gap for some nationalities who can afford it and make it work is to arrive by air to Nicaragua, which often involves changing planes in, in many places. You can sort of see flights going like from Istanbul to Bogota to San Salvador and then or 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 or, or 
yeah, so there are things like that there too. And then to, to Managua, where Nicaragua may charge you a hefty fee if you are from one of the green or blue countries here, but you can arrive visa free if you go that way. And of course, the hefty fee compared to the cost of everything else, including, you know, your smugglers fees is just one more expense. So some people are avoiding the dotty end now by flying directly to Nicaragua, which has the United States up in arms, but there are no barely any diplomatic relations between the United States government and the Ortega Murillo regime in Nicaragua. So that's another route. But then, okay, you've gotten into Panama, you've gotten into Nicaragua. Just very briefly, Panama will whisk you out of the country on a bus if you can pay the fare, which is about 50 bucks. Costa Rica will whisk you out into Nicaragua. Nicaragua has no interest in keeping you there, but everybody who's gone through that I've talked to says it's a miserable time where, where everybody's shaking you down and it's very disorderly. But eventually you get to Honduras, which also, as long as you register and you get a piece of paper saying you can be in the country for five days, you need that piece of paper in order to take a bus. You take that bus, you're at the Guatemala border. Guatemala and Mexico do make more of a show, which, you know, I should say, the countries that whisk you out on a bus, that does cut organized crime and corrupt officials out of the picture more because you, you're just, you're barely touching ground in those countries and, and there's not much of a chance to shake you down or, or, or assault you. But the United States isn't crazy about it because these countries are, you know, they don't have a lot of resources. So they don't go crazy. They don't really come down too hard on them. But the United States government does not love the idea of countries green lighting migrants heading to the United States. So Guatemala and Mexico do not offer that green light. They at least make a show of blocking or detaining or deporting uh, migrants. You know, Guatemala will deport usually one or 2,000 people, mostly Venezuelan, but other countries as well, back into Honduras every, every month. And Mexico, of course, claims to, claims to detain now more than 100,000 people a year. Detainer, or I should say apprehend more than 100,000 a year and, and, and deports, has in some countries, in some years, deported more than 100,000 people back into Central America, mostly occasionally to Cuba, Venezuela, or Haiti as well. But as we'll see, and as you can see from the numbers I've already shown you, that hasn't slowed down the number of people getting across Guatemala and Mexico. It's just made the experience much more miserable and much more dangerous. Because if there's a chance of running afoul of the state, you may have a real incentive to hire a hire a, a smuggler who, well, let me get to that in a minute. You arrive here in Tapachula, which is uh, just outside Tapachula. This is Ciudad Hidalgo. I'm, I took this picture looking into Guatemala. And at that point, there, there may be or may not be migration officials looking for you to round you up and check your papers. And you've got to get past them somehow. Or you have to just hang out in Tapachula and apply for asylum or to apply for some other status and hope that something eventually happens. This is often where those famous caravans begin, where people try to do safety in numbers and, and travel together. Those don't work anymore because Mexico has really cracked down on anybody transporting members of caravans and it's just way too long to walk. But caravans do form still often as a protest move. People want Mexico's immigration authorities to give them some kind of status so they can be in Mexico, which of course they can then use to get to the United States. And those occasionally work. So people, you still will see in the papers like caravans forming in, in Mexico's southernmost state of Chiapas. But this is where the journey begins to get across Mexico. And migrants will often tell you, you know, the Darien was bad, Mexico was worse. Because the state, the government has this incentive to round you up and if they do catch you to quite often nobody's watching the police or the immigration authorities will just use it as an opportunity to shake you down for money one really dangerous thing though is even beyond the government it's people who operate usually with no opposition at all from the government and maybe collusion from the government to kidnap you or otherwise extort you there is tens of thousands of times a year people in 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 mexico migrating across mexico from other countries get kidnapped by gangs, by organized crime, increasingly from organized crime that is tied to or members of the big cartels. And what they do is lock you up somewhere, beat you up, and then to use, you know, send cell phone messages to your relatives or anybody you know in the United States who might be able to come up with some ransom money with orders to say, here's, here's your loved one. They're going to die unless you send money. And 
many people in the United States and elsewhere are getting these extortion demands, having to wire money to people inside Mexico in order to get their loved ones free. And yeah, I mean, they often do get free, but a lot of people disappear forever this way too. This, especially across from South Texas, is, is extremely bad. People who operate migrant shelters in places like Reynosa, Matamoros, Nuevo Laredo say that an enormous number of the migrants who appear in their shelters have emerged from spending days in absolute miserable conditions after being kidnapped by organized crime. And you know, the kidnapping rings, you don't see a lot of news about arrests either of the main nodes on the kidnapping networks or of Mexican officials who may be colluding with them. So there's a huge incentive to travel without, with a smuggler because without a smuggler, it, is, it, takes, it can take weeks to get across Mexico, but these are also some of the most dangerous weeks of these people's lives. It makes the Darien Gap look like a walk in the park. Again, Tamaulipas across from South Texas is a place where a lot of migrants have been massacred and kidnappings are incredibly frequent. So there's a strong incentive to to pay a smuggler. Now, a smuggler can get you across Mexico you know, in a bus or in a van, uh, and it'll take two or three days maybe, and then you'll be, you'll be delivered to Border Patrol, um, usually en masse. You see these you know, news reports all the time of hundreds of people turning themselves into Border Patrol all at the same time, say, by the, by the border wall in Arizona lately. That's the smuggling industry, and it can cost you five, six, seven, eight, nine more thousand dollars. The more you pay, often the more... The, the, the less arduous your journey is. Why do smugglers charge so much? I mean, they're keeping some of the money for themselves, but that means they have to spread a lot of it around. And this is the big, for me, the big untold story of what's happening on the migrant route across Mexico is the corruption that makes all of this possible. The United States often asks Mexico to do more to crack down. They don't ever ask Mexico, at least not publicly, probably because of diplomatic sensitivities, to do more to crack down on its own corruption. But the reason the smugglers' fees are so are so exorbitant is because it costs a lot of money to make sure everybody in every checkpoint looks the other way or that you arrive at the checkpoint when the right people are there that you know if you are stopped that they can make the payoffs if and then it's not just government it's also once you get into northern mexico there may be payments to make to organized crime too for the right to use their territory to move people across the border but yeah smuggler if you're with a smuggler you know, your mileage may vary, but your your probability of making it more easily to the U.S.-Mexico border uh, across Mexico is much greater. And that's because, again, of Mexico's policy, uh, U.S.-approved policy of cracking down on uh, people trying to migrate across its country. If you could just get on a bus across Mexico, the United States would go crazy. But if everybody could just get on a bus, uh, they would, organized crime would be cut out of literally billions of dollars. So... You get to the U.S.-Mexico border, if you're one of the people who does not want to turn themselves in to Border Patrol, if you want to you know, work and not go through the asylum process, you don't have an asylum case, you want to escape, you know, avoid being apprehended by Border Patrol, that usually means, I mean, there's been a huge buildup of border security over the past 30 years. Um, you've got 740 miles of fences and walls. You've got you know, a border patrol that increased fivefold between the early 90s and the early 2010s, you are not going to be crossing in a more populated or more accessible area if you are trying not to be caught. You're going to have to cross somewhere way off in the desert or in the difficult scrublands of Texas, or you're going through trying to swim across the, the Rio Grande or, or really treacherous irrigation canals, and you are running a real risk of dying. Border Patrol's own estimates say that almost 10,000 people have died on U.S. soil since over the last 25 years. And any regional, and you go to one region like southern Arizona or the California border and talk to groups that actually do humanitarian work and try to find bodies or people in danger, and they'll say, no, no, the numbers in this region are way higher than Border Patrol admits. It's one of the enormous, just enormous tragedies and un... un untold or un, unappreciated scandals of the entire policy is the number of people just dying inside the U.S. borders, inside the jurisdiction of our civilized United States, who um, die excruciating deaths of, you know, heat exhaustion and exposure to they just, you know, your body cooks or, or, or dehydration or, you know, animal, animal attacks or bites, uh, a lot of drownings, all of them preventable all of them preventable. And we just find, you know, we U.S. citizens just find bodies 
in some of the most horrible conditions in South Texas, in Arizona, and elsewhere, and nothing ever really gets done about it other than some increase in Border Patrol's rescue capacity. But yeah, you can see the numbers of, of deaths are increasing as the amount of migration increases. But if you do want to turn yourself in, and you do want to enter, say, the asylum or protection process, the ideal way to do this, and the way the law says that you're supposed to cross the border, is to go to one of the 45 or so official border crossings or land border ports of entry <clears throat> that are set up across the border. And there, that's where you enter with inspection, it's called. You show up and you, you, you approach a CBP officer on U.S. soil and say, I fear going back to my country, uh, I want to start an asylum process. That's the way it's supposed to work. Obviously, that would require a lot of capacity at these ports of entry that are often quite overwhelmed as it is. We have, while the United States has invested a lot in border patrol and border technologies and walls and things like that, the ports of entry have really gone starving by comparison. There's not as much investment in ports of entry. So the capacity of ports of entry to deal with this rather this you know 10 year old now trend of more asylum seekers just has not kept up. And instead of building capacity and saying, okay, well, we'll t you want asylum, okay, we'll come, we'll take you to a processing center off-site, and just like Border Patrol does, and, and we'll start your process. Instead, they have, since 2016, and then intensifying during the Trump administration, placed CBP officers on the line, on the borderline itself, or in the middle of the bridges over the Rio Grande in Texas, and you cannot set foot on U.S. soil and therefore have that right to ask for asylum unless you show that you have some legal status to be in the United States. This is called metering, and its courts have, have ruled against it, and we'll see, it still happens to a great extent, but basically the, the idea here is that maybe we will take, at this port of entry, we'll take a few dozen people a day who are asylum seekers, but everybody else is just going to have to wait. So they've metered in the number of people who can come to a port of entry every day. The people who, uh, this, as I said, began when a bunch of Haitians came in 2016, um, and they started putting people on the line in, in south of San Diego, so it was no longer possible to um, simply get on U.S. soil and ask for asylum. The people who are not metered in right away, the people who um, are told to come back later, what happened starting around 2000, well, actually it's happened in 2016, but then really began more around 2018 throughout the border, is that the migrants themselves or local authorities, depends on the town, started their own systems of, you know, signing people up. Here you see this notebook that that the migrants themselves organized. This was a man from Nicaragua who was in charge of the notebook at the time, where people just write their names and are assigned a number, and you wait and wait and wait and wait in the Mexican border city until your number comes up. And that's, you know, CBP says, we'll take 30 people today. That means, you know, we'll do the next 30 numbers, and people can cross legally that way. But the wait lasted months in you know, people from other countries waiting in places like Tijuana, Ciudad Juarez, other Mexican border cities where they don't know anybody, have no way to get an income, and are just stuck there waiting for the opportunity to cross the right way to ask for protection. Um, in the last year or so, really starting in January of 2023, the Biden administration started using an app, CBP-1, which one of its features is the ability to make an appointment at a port of entry if you are in Mexico, north of Mexico City. And CBP-1, it's certainly an improvement over those you know, the very, very dodgy and, and, and informal waiting lists. But what it does is right now they're giving 1,450 appointments per day to people applying on the app in northern Mexico. That still has some problems. What if you don't have a cell phone? What if you don't have good internet? What if you don't speak the right language of the app? All those things. And you know, the, but the, the larger problem with CBP-1 is the number of appointments. You know, it's about 45,000 people a month, which sounds like a lot, but the number of asylum seekers crossing the the rivers and, and jumping the wall, etc., to to turn themselves into border patrol is still a multiple of that because the, it does not meet the actual demand for asylum right now in the United States. But it's also a worldwide demand. Any country that that is seen as safe, including Mexico, which had about 140,000 asylum uh, requests last year, is receiving a large number of asylum seekers. So the, the amount of appointments for CBP-1 is not enough. CBP's you know, capacity to process people at the ports of entry is still not enough. And this can be fixed by taking people to processing centers that are not right on the border, the same way Border Patrol does when they get large numbers of people coming.
You can see CBP1 though, you know, has taken uh, an increasing number of people, but it's really leveled off since July. We have not seen any further increases. And I've, I've not heard of any plans to, to increase the number any further. So what happens if you can't get an appointment right away, you're forced to wait for months, which is now happening with CBP1, the temptation to just jump over the wall um, is, is, pretty, is pretty large. I took this picture less than a mile east of the San Diego port of entry. This was before the new Trump era tall border wall went in. But you can see where all the, the concertina wire is all squished down in places where people just go over and just stand between what in this area is a double layer of wall and just stand there and wait for border patrol to turn themselves in that way. Because then at least, you know, it's, it's technically illegal and you might run afoul of the Biden asylum rule and things like that, but there, are, there is no waiting. You can actually start your life and start your asylum process much more quickly if you jump over the barbed wire. Here's a similar situation that I took this picture where the Colorado River meets Mexico and there's sort of like a little right turn in the border wall. Here's a place where people wait on the riverbank and so many people from so many countries, you can, there were people here from Eastern Europe, so many people come that Border Patrol has actually put in a porter potty and, and some shade uh, where people can wait for Border Patrol to come by and pick them up several times a day. Um, that's that's how systematic it has gotten, um, and th but this is because they can't come to a port of entry with an appointment as easily. Um, once you are, um, once you do um, ask for asylum, um, you know they, they don't just immediately release you in the United States or, or lock everybody up. A lot of people are processed. There's a up to a but under normal conditions when they're not too crowded is an up to 72 hour process where Border Patrol will keep you, keep you and your family, usually in miserable conditions like this. These are the famous kids in cages, um, where. Uh, you know, it's it's at least clean, I guess, and they feed you sort of. But while this is happening, um, you know, you're you're starting your asylum paperwork. They might um, you know, do what they can to ascertain that the children you're with are really your children. Uh, they might do criminal background checks. They almost always do. They're taking your biometrics. All those other. Th this is called processing, and they'll also, in most cases, say, "What city are you going to? Do you have an address there, um, so that we can send you your, you know, all the the things having to do with your asylum case, and you will start your asylum case, and you'll be assigned to the immigration court in that area." In most cases, you will be released. Uh, lately, it's most cases uh, with what's called a notice to appear in immigration court. You, if you are unlucky, you will be, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's just talk about this. Uh, in most cases, you will be released. This is the bus station in McAllen, Texas, where a bunch of people had just been dropped off by Border Patrol. And, you know, you, people here are not, they have no desire to stay really in Texas border cities. Almost all of them are, are going somewhere else in the U.S. interior where they know somebody. They may even have like some work lined up. They have relatives. They have a place to stay and they're going there. So they're all lining up for bus tickets. While you're stuck in those border cities, though, waiting for your bus ticket or figuring out what the heck you're going to do with your life at this point, there are places in almost every U.S. border city now, usually nonprofit, but some of them getting federal grants that are receiving people for a couple of days. Sometimes they just don't even have bed space, but they're places where you can get something to eat, maybe get a chance to bathe, get some advice with your, maybe talk to at least people with some legal knowledge, and also make arrangements to for your travel into, into the U.S. interior where you're going to await all of the pr proceedings for your your, your your asylum application. These places play just such a crucial role, these respite centers, because without them, people would just be dropped off on the street. And actually right now, as federal grant money is running out, we are seeing in San Diego right now, and maybe soon in Tucson, what they call street releases, where Border Patrol, you know, they're full, they're processing facilities that you know, are, are, are full, and they've got to let people, leave people somewhere, and the shelters can no longer take them because they, they, they don't have a facility anymore. So in San Diego, as we speak, in early March 2024, hundreds of people a day are being left at a trolley station and volunteers are just doing what they can to try to orient them. That is what these respite centers are set up to avoid. Um, they have increasingly become a target of right-wing politicians uh, who uh, really irresponsibly are accusing them of harboring migrants, where in fact, nearly all of the migrants that they, they take care of um, have legal status in the United States that notice to appear in, a, in immigration court gives you a legal status to be in the United States pending the outcome of your case. Um, in terms of just finding where you're going and getting there, 
the enormous majority of people traveling into the U.S. interior are doing so with their own money or with the money of relatives or friends who are helping to bring them, say, if you're going to Seattle or Boston or Miami, wherever the heck you're going. Now, the governor of Texas, who is a big opponent of migra this kind of immigration, started saying, he said, Greg Abbott said in 2021, I'm going to make those Democratic Party mayors around the country feel some of the pain. I'm going to put them on buses, uh, put these migrants who, on, on buses and send them to the cities. And a lot of the people who ended up going on these buses were people who didn't have contacts in the United States and, and were like, oh, New York sounds good. I'll go to New York. Um, and to date, um, as of late February, Texas has sent almost 104,000 people on buses to those cities that you can see there, which two things about that. First, it's a small portion of the literally millions of people since 2021 who have come here asking for asylum and been released into the U.S. interior. So it's not, you know, everybody's like, Texas is overwhelming New York. Well, Texas is playing a role, but it's only a, a portion of all of the people arriving by bus or by plane to New York and other big cities. But also look at that other one, the, the, the a records request by the Texas newsroom at the end of February found that Texas has already spent $148 million on these buses. You divide $148 million by 104000 that is about $1,400 per passenger. What are these buses? A lot of profits are being made by that contracting. And there's, I mean, that's a, that's a huge, I mean, the, the bus does not cost that much. A lot of people are, or, or some people, I should say, who are well-connected to Texas state government appear to be profiting really handsomely off of this initiative. So, okay, you're left in the U.S. interior. Hopefully you're not being detained. Right now, the United States is not, as a matter of policy, detaining uh, parents with children. Um, no situation where, you know, the, the, the guideline is what is in the best interest of the child and a detention center is not in the best interest of the child. And it just costs too much to have a detention center that has conditions that would make it a licensed child care facility. So people with kids are, are generally released into the U.S. interior, but they are put in alternatives to detention programs, which very often means some kind of GPS monitoring of their whereabouts, like you would with a, a prisoner on work release or something like that. They're wearing these ankle monitors, or they have phones or devices that they have to check in with at all hours. Whenever the thing says, you know, check in now, they have to check in, and that keep track of their whereabouts. Those are actually the, the, those programs are run by some of the same companies, the private prison companies that that run ICE detention centers. Um, but still, the cost of these programs, which when they are good, involve a lot of check-ins and contacts with a human being, a case officer who can actually make sure you make all of your court dates and that you uh, are are connected with the services you need. Um, no matter what, it looks like it costs a absolute fraction of what detention, especially family detention in a detention center, would cost. So these alternatives to detention programs, particularly the case management form of those uh, programs, are a, a big a big improvement over detention. And people in these programs, people released into the U.S. interior, according to groups like the American Inter in Immigration Council, which has, has dug up information, say that uh, the vast majority of them do show up for their court dates and for their appointments uh, with ICE and others because they want to they, they want to go through the asylum system, and they also want things like the work permits that come with an active asylum application. But an, an unlucky number of single adults do end up in detention centers. Often you'll even see husbands and wives put into separate detention centers, put into ISIS system all around the country. Right now, the, uh, more than 40,000 people, not all of them asylum seekers, but right now more than 40,000 people are in immigration detention all around the country, often in really medieval conditions run by prison corporations that are not getting the over say they deserve because of the way they are treating people who have committed it maybe an administrative offense but have not committed a criminal offense are being treated like criminals in these detention centers and groups that monitor human rights conditions in these in these centers just have in just a, a steady deluge of accounts of really inhumane treatment in a lot of these they've gotten a really bad name now some in an unlucky number also may be deported you may be deported if, if you were determined not to be seeking asylum or if your asylum uh, case finally uh, was turned down or if you were submitted to an initial screening interview for your asylum case, which happens to oh, about about 20, 25,000 people a month and you did not pass that screening interview 
or you cross between ports of entry and under the Biden asylum rule, which went into effect in May, uh, you were denied asylum because of the way you crossed and the fact that you did not seek asylum in another country along the way. There's a lot of reasons why you might end up being put deported. If you're from Mexico, you can be deported over the land border. If you're from Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, or Nicaragua right now under the asylum rule, you may be sent into Mexico, although that, that seems to be happening to just a few thousand people a month out of a much larger population. The rest are, are flown on ice aircraft. There's usually about 120, 125 flights a month right now. About two thirds of those go to El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua, and, and I'm sorry, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. The the other 40 or so, one third of them go everywhere else in the world. In a lot of countries like you know Venezuela is not taking U.S. Uh, deportation flights. China doesn't take them. There's a lot of places that they simply don't go. And even uh, you know uh, these flights are expensive. If you're going someplace more than a thousand miles away, it probably costs at least a thousand dollars per person to deport. So these aren't heavily used. But I think that if if the if, if ICE had the budget, this would be a much larger program. These forced returns of people who you know either didn't get access to the asylum system or were turned down. If you do have an asylum case, you can count on being in the United States for years, sometimes several years, without a decision being issued. Once uh, you've cleared, if, if you were su submitted to uh, an initial credible fear screening interview, or if you weren't at all, you are awaiting a case in immigration court. Quite often, you know, I'm speaking in early 2024, it is not unusual at all to get a, a document saying you should report in 2026 or 2027, uh, depending on the immigration court uh, around the country that you're involved in. Um, our immigration courts are ridiculously backlogged because we have a ridiculously small number of uh, judges and asylum officers. Both numbers are in the 700s right now for a backlog, not just asylum cases, of all cases, a backlog of about 3.3 million cases, 4,500 cases per judge. So the chances of them getting to you in a prompt way, in a way that really gives you due process is small. And that means that, you know, even if you don't have a strong asylum case, you can be here um, with a work permit and you're really starting a precarious life but starting a life here for a few years with a legal status, even if that legal status gets revoked when you get turned down. And that weight itself, let's be honest, can be its own draw for people. People have cell phones. They are on social media. They're hearing from relatives and other contacts who got here and have a status that is here at least until you know their, their court dates, which is years from now. And that itself can become a pull because of the inefficiency and just well, I wouldn't blame them for being inefficient, for the disinvestment and the, the small size and small capacity of our immigration courts and our asylum system. And our asylum system, too, it, it's, it's part of the U.S. Justice Department. It is not a separate branch of government. Um, they all answer to the attorney general. And there's just an incredibly wide range of outcomes, depending on which city your immigration court is in. As you can see here, you know, if you're in Atlanta, your chance of, of having a positive outcome in your asylum case is about a quarter of what it would be if you were in New York. And nothing really explains this other than to some extent the population that settles there and to some extent just the attitudes of the judges who have been assigned to those courts. Now, some of those judges definitely have a dark view of asylum and see this as General Kelly, who at the time was the Secretary of Homeland Security under Donald Trump, told the Senate, sorry, yeah, the Senate said, this is a huge scam. All these asylum seekers, they just say magic words and then they get to go into this years long process. And that is a very common critique of the asylum process and a reason why a lot of people, including a lot of moderates right now, are taking on positions that, that would want to do away with or at least partially end access to asylum in the United States states. But when you look at the actual numbers, asylum, uh, people who apply for asylum quite often have strong cases. Cases that actually made it to a decision in 2023, the 71,500 on the left here, according to track immigration, of those cases, nearly half resulted in grants of asylum and another 2% were rescued from being deported because they qualified for some other kind of protection. Half half of people who made it to a verdict. But you know, not everybody makes it to a verdict. There's also cases that get closed or people who just stop showing up or or you know, they don't make it through screening interviews and things like that. What's the actual percentage of people who start the application process to the of, of those who start the application process, the percentage of people who make it? You know, there's not really good published data about that, but uh, Senator Graham asked Secretary Mayorkas in a hearing about this uh, last November and just kind of tried to nail him down on a number. And Mayorkas said, well, about 75% get turned down. 
The other 25% then are getting asylum. So if you have a million people a year, and it's actually been a bit more than that lately, asking for asylum in the United States, that's a quarter million people right there who, had you sent them back, would have faced a high enough probability of death, imprisonment, torture, had you sent them back. You know, that, that, that really justifies having the process. That is not a needle in a haystack. That is a significant number of people who really do have a strong case and are not at all scamming you. We do, what we need here is the capacity to judge these cases as quickly as due process allows so that people aren't here for years coming to that, that decision. That in one quarter of cases is actually a grant of protection. So, but instead of building up our asylum system, instead of building up processing, instead of building up um, uh, alternatives to detention and adjudication, we have seen administration after administration now just try to find some way to limit access, limit the flow, block people, and and you know deport and detain. Um, but it turns out, you know, every time we've seen one of these policies carried out, what this chart is showing is that a policy gets implemented and you see the numbers don't, you know, it's not a steady upward flow. The numbers go down, but then they always recover. They go down after a, a new tough policy is implemented and then they recover. The, the number, of people, number of people arriving at the border bounces right back up. What you see is that policies never really keep migrants from coming for more than a few months at a time. And that goes for really tough policies like family separation or the Remain in Mexico policy. Title 42 itself, they did not deter migration for a very long time. And, you know, right now we are seeing in the U.S. debate in the spring of 2024, uh, the Biden administration signaling that it would be okay with new me mechanisms to do away with asylum, like some sort of Title 42 expulsions if the daily number of asylum seekers exceeds a certain threshold. But as, you know, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we thought that this this is what would actually, as President Biden says, shut down the border and, and, and keep the numbers down for a while. This would only have a short-term impact because... A, we've already talked about the reasons people are coming, which are really, it's hard to emulate that level of misery simply through our own border policies, and nor should we even try, but B, our own system is so inefficient that people will st still keep coming. And, you know, even if we did find some way to deport everybody, there just aren't enough planes. There just aren't enough planes. And your probability of being released into the United States will remain high, even if these new push the numbers down policies were implemented. But still, word of the policy being implemented could reverberate throughout, you know, migrants' word of mouth and, and smugglers' networks and, and put everybody in wait and see mode for a few months and you would see numbers go down. But do not pat yourself on the back if the numbers go down because that is not really a result of a fix to a very, very, very broken system. Now, this is a whole other talk, so I'm just going to do this in one slide, but what would a better functioning system look at look like? I mean, I think I've been hinting at a lot of this, but for one thing, I mean, our policies, the United States and other donor nations policies have to really get serious about addressing root causes in source countries, and those root causes include corruption and impunity. It's not just job creation and, you know, police reform. It has to be a, an approach that actually makes some pro-U.S. elites uncomfortable because those elites neglect and corruption are part of the reason why people are unprotected and leaving in such large numbers. Our own laws should change. And of course, that's not something we're going to see happen in 2024, but temporary work visas, residency permits, access to the refugee resettlement program, and, and, and much else is, is absolutely necessary because it's just crazy to make this many people walk all the way across <laughs> South America, Central America, and Mexico to set foot on U.S. soil because that's the only way to get here. But the only way to really increase those other pathways is through changes in the law. The Biden administration, to its credit, has been opening what few pathways exist in current law, like humanitarian parole and temporary protected status, but those are all temporary. Not everybody who comes here um, needs to settle in the United States. Um, a lot of people uh, uh, who are fleeing might be just as happy to be in Mexico or, or other countries along the way. And Mexico's asylum system has grown, but it could be doing much more uh, to protect and integrate people uh, who may not need uh, to come necessarily to the United States in order to feel safe. And that's a lot of people. Certainly, we have to work with Mexico to punish the corruption and organized crime activity, which are completely interrelated, that makes that journey through Mexico so terrifying. And some of that may be finding pathways for people who absolutely need to get across the country. Once people do get here, without changing the law under current 
you know, kind of under, the, under the current tools we have, we have to strengthen our processing tools at ports of entry so we can stop this incentive for people to cross the Rio Grande or, or, or go you know, to gaps in the fence and things like that. People should be processed where CBP is. That makes the most sense. Um, alternatives to detention programs, especially the, the case management variety of them that involve a lot more human contact, need to be broadly expanded. And, and of course, our immigration court system, the caseloads, the amount of time to adjudicate cases has to be reduced while preserving and even strengthening due process for people. That sort of investment in processing case management and adjudication is just hasn't grown as fast as it should. What we need here, especially after 10 years now of asylum seekers coming in large numbers, is a moonshot. We need something that is really historic and not incremental because this is the population that we and the rest of the world are seeing in the 21st century. We have to get used to it. We have to get better at adjudicating it. And we're just not there yet. It can happen for similar or less than the cost of building more hundreds of miles of border wall. We have to get our minds in that in that place. And you know, I didn't make a slide for this, but I should just as an aside mention that border wall, look, if there's a border wall on the bank of the Rio Grande, that stops people who don't want it, but it slows down people who don't want to be caught. It doesn't stop asylum seekers. Asylum seekers just want to be on U.S. soil, and the bank of the Rio Grande south of the border wall is U.S. soil. So your wall is just a backdrop for your picture of asylum seekers turning themselves into border patrol. It does not deter them. So that's my spiel. That's my 101 version of, of what's happening at the border right now. Um, congratulations to you if you sat through this entire presentation. Uh, if you have questions, uh, how to contact me is on my website, um, and I will try to uh, answer if I am able. Uh, but in the meantime, feel free to download this PDF from this the PDF from this address bit.ly, all lowercase border dash 101 dash March dash 2024. Um, thank you so much for listening. This clearly, if you've made it through this far, this means you're super interested in this topic. I welcome your interest. We absolutely need people who are going to educate themselves about what you've seen as a really complex, a really vexing set of issues that is not going to be solved with short-term election year sloganeering. And if we do try that, we're going to actually hurt a lot of people unnecessarily.